Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to have you here with us. During this webcast, we'll be covering a very timely subject, vulnerability lifecycle management and all the right ingredients to make your digital transformation safer. As I'm sure you all are all well aware, security isn't just a topic anymore, it's the topic. We're very fortunate today to have two gentlemen with us that are very familiar with helping companies protect themselves against the security threats popping up daily in the news. My name is Rich Hancock, and I'll be your moderator today. I work on the field marketing team here at GitLab. Before we get started, I'm going to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for that. We have dedicated time for questions at the end of the webcast, but you can go ahead and send in your questions as you think of them, and we'll make sure to get to them at the end. Posted up for you now is the agenda slide. As you can see, we're going to do a quick <clears throat> introduction, uh, and then Nate Ashford will uh, kick us off with the presentation portion. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, you can use the chat function to get in touch with the team for help. Lastly, we'll be recording today's presentation just so everyone in attendance is aware. The recording will be delivered to all the registrants in the next few days. Also a reminder, at the end of the webinar, we'll be giving you a link to a survey and you have a chance to take home some amazing prizes, including a Ring 12-piece home security kit, Amazon gift card, or Apple AirPod Pros. Our presenters today are Matt Wilson, GitLab's Senior Product Marketing Manager focusing on vulnerability management. Matt has spent over a decade working as a software engineer before making the jump to product management. Prior to GitLab, Matt helped bring the first AI-driven cybersecurity solution to a customer audience. He also managed software products for a variety of industries, including legal and compliance, digital publishing, and digital content distribution and fulfillment. Matt lives just outside Austin, Texas with his wife and two children. And we have Nate Ashford, a strategic technical coach for C-Prime. Nate is an experienced architect, agilist, and business leader focused on helping organizations navigate technology transformation to innovate and adapt to the accelerating rate of change in the market. He has a passion for developing high-performing teams and organizations that focus on the consistent and repeated delivery of business value and for embracing the change inherent in achieving those. Over 20 years as an agile coach and practitioner, Nate has developed a simple pragmatic approach that draws from multiple frameworks and methodologies and emphasizes empathy, personal growth, growth, and process automation. Now, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Matt to give you a high-level overview of who GitLab is. Thanks, Rich. So GitLab is really the one platform that can deliver a complete DevOps experience for your entire SDLC and a single application. So what we often see today is a very fragmented DIY approach to DevOps. You have dozens, if not hundreds of point solutions that are stitched together to try to plug all the various holes in a complete DevOps process. Well, this can be very difficult, not to mention costly to manage. Now compare that with something like GitLab, where you do have one single application that covers all of the DevOps process. You'll end up with compressed cycle times, revenue accelerations and cost reductions because you're not paying for as well as managing all of those point solutions. And a single data model will lead to a lower error rate as well as better insights across the organization. Next slide, please. Now GitLab is a very comprehensive application with dozens if not hundreds of features, but it's also extremely flexible. So you pick the point where you want to start. We find that a lot of our customers like to begin with our best-in-class source code management or continuous integration. From there, it's easy to expand and grow. For instance, you can expand into your project or product management with issue tracking, issue boards, and epic creation and our value stream management. You can also manage out onto the infrastructure side, whether you're doing something cloud native or you're managing maybe a hybrid cloud environment or even traditional deployment architecture. You can also Take advantage of our embedded security tools to make sure that your development process is not only as secure as possible, but that you're incorporating your security teams in the same shared space with your IT or ops in your development teams. So no matter where you need to start, GitLab has something for you and we have room to grow to cover all of your organization's DevOps needs. 
Back to you, Rich. Thank you, Matt. We'll uh, talk with you again in a moment, but now let's get to the presentation portion with a look at all the right ingredients to make your digital transformation successful with C Prime's Nate Ashford. Nate, take it away. Okay. Well, thanks for that introduction, Rick. Um, uh, so as mentioned, I, I'm part of the C Prime team. I, I actually lead a group of technical coaches. We're all experienced software engineers and architects, folks who've been doing and making software for a very long time and uh, contribute our experience to help others to, uh, to, to do it well as well. We like to make awesome and we like to help other people make awesome. Uh, so C Prime itself is a consultancy that works with uh, a, a number of large clients you would recognize uh, and has partnerships across a, a broad range of tools and capabilities, including our friends here at GitLab uh, to help our customers deliver great work and, uh, and make life easier and, and I, it, as they're doing so. Um, Few of the folks you might recognize, uh, just a, a few of the, the uh, organizations we've worked with. Um, all of these folks we've been uh, we've worked with as part of our efforts to improve what they do, to cook up something a little good, something good. Um, you know, so I happen to be a uh, a little bit of a an amateur chef, maybe even a little bit more than amateur. Uh, I've actually catered a couple of weddings and other large events. And, and I love that experience of just cooking up something awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, so there's- So sorry to interrupt you. I'm not oh. seeing green. Yep, hold on a second. I, that's because I failed to share it. Let me, I, you know, this is, this is You're what- You're doing happened. great. I'm so sorry to interrupt you there, but thank you very much. Yep, just a second. Uh, I did everything except actually hit the share button. I, so real quick. Uh, there's all our cool marketing material, um, all the fun logos that you can see. Um, you guys can see that all, right? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So I, I like to cook up some awesome um, is where we were at. And, uh, and I would be a pretty poor chef if I uh, threw out a plate with just a couple of carrots on it. And, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that, that no catering client would ever uh, accept that as even being considered cooking. Um, and, and yet, quite often, uh, customers, uh, organizations will come to us looking for, hey, we want DevOps, right? And what they, you know, as we kind of probe into that and ask the question, uh, a lot of times what they're asking for is, well, I just, I just want the tool. I just want the, a, a thing to give me the, the, the DevOps pipeline, the, the continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, I just want the thing and then like, we're good, right? We got DevOps, like, awesome, congratulations, we did it. Um, but really, I mean, there, there's so much more to it than that. Again, much like the, the, for the, the chef, um, you couldn't just throw that one little thing down on the plate and, and call that enough. There's so much more to work with and I, so we've actually taken a little bit of time and looked at the uh, the whole tool chain across the uh, the entire software development lifecycle, and started looking at what are the capabilities, like what is in DevOps, what does it include, and and it's a whole range of things. And admittedly, to to uh, Matt's earlier point here, uh, our friends at GitLab, their products support a lot of these different capabilities. But it's so much more than just the continuous delivery pipelines that is here, right? Uh, it's there is there's the uh, everything from how do we plan and uh, it both in terms of how do we collaborate as a team and how do we design to how do we support it, how do we monitor it, how do we release it, and and all of those different pieces. And so we have here then uh, a. Uh, a stacked view of uh, like starting at the bottom, what's, what are the basics and then moving up to more advanced topics. And we'll come back to that in a minute uh, and, and look at it a little closer. But first the question then is if, if DevOps includes all of this stuff, what do I actually use? And that really depends on what is it you're cooking up, right? Because as a chef, 
right? If I'm cooking a romantic dinner for my significant other, I, I'm, I might go with rack of lamb and a nice cherry glaze and some balsamic roasted uh, Brussels sprouts and some fingerling potatoes. But if I'm cooking for four starving crying children uh, who just, uh, I, and I need something quick, I'm probably gonna go mac and cheese and chicken nuggets because I know that will satisfy them and, uh, and I can produce it pretty quickly. And so what I'm gonna use, what ingredients I'm gonna bring into play here are entirely dependent on what outcome I'm looking for. When organizations come to us saying, hey, uh, we wanna be agile, you know, can you help us? Or, hey, we want DevOps, can, can you help us? One of the questions I like to ask is, okay, great, but DevOps in service of what? DevOps isn't the end, it's, uh, it's a means. It's a means to achieve, achieve some other goal. And, and so we have to actually take the moment to, to think about what is it that we want to achieve. And then from that, we can then look across the, the whole gamut of, uh, of ingredients and start selecting those ones that actually matter to us. You know, if what I'm trying to do is a, is a digital uh, modernization, then I, well, gee, I, I'm actually going to care about, uh, can we do this stuff cloud native? And if I want to do cloud native, then let's think about, can we add in the containerization? Can we uh, provide the infrastructure and automation and configuration management? Can we get to auto scaling and all those different pieces? And that's going to start defining what it is we want. But there's still then the question of, well, okay, which, but which ingredients go together? Like, how do I know if, if I'm trying to go to say to the cloud, how do I know which ones, what things I need to pull together to make that work? Well, we started to actually map that out. And I, the, uh, this is a little bit of an eye chart. I'll show you a, a closer view in a minute. Um, but I, we started mapping out all those different capabilities that are on our periodic table of DevOps and measuring what does that look like for us? And uh, how do we go about uh, defining the dependencies and the relationships between these capabilities? And we started recognizing that there are, uh, hold on a second. Um, there are some, uh, the, some relationships here, and I'll just kind of use my arrow here. Um, there are some relationships of uh, some things are required before other things. Uh, some things open up other possibilities. Uh, so for example, infrastructure as code opens up uh, some configuration management, which opens up secrets management uh, so that we can get, we can protect the passwords and other things and not include them in the source code. As soon as we start doing that kind of stuff, we can start using all that for our server automation. And, and again, these, these pathways start to open up. And so if I want this thing down here, it, where we're talking about cloud and uh, auto scaling infrastructure and the like, then I've got to work back from there on all the dependencies and all the different pieces, all the things I need to get there. So pro tip though, don't try to do all of it. I, it's really easy to get overwhelmed by there's all of this stuff. And admittedly, again, like GitLab supports a uh, uh, vast majority of all these. But the key is focus on what can I get better at right now and, uh, and just take the next step. Open up the path to what you want to accomplish. Uh, so to the earlier point, if what I'm trying to do is, is get to cloud, then let's focus on the things that are going to open up that path that are going to get me to being able to do cloud and not just do, do cloud as I, you know, I can take an application pick it up, lift and shift, put it right straight in the cloud. And that's great, but the, to get the value out of that, I actually need the other pieces that come, that come along with it. And so think about what's gonna open up that path. What's gonna help you get the value that, that you need out of that. And think about uh, what opens up future options as well. Because uh, there's a strategic element here of thinking about uh, where, where am I gonna go and what's gonna be value. And the, and there are some crucial pieces that, I, that as we unlock those, they're going to open up other steps for us. And we've actually, I, in our map here, 
we've started to, to mark some of those. We've, uh, so for example, continuous delivery pipelines, one of those things that we talk about all the time. You notice all the arrows coming off of it. There's a ton of different other capabilities that if we've got continuous, uh, the continuous delivery pipelines in place, it makes it a whole lot easier to do all these other things. Things like build and test metrics, things about uh, plugging in our browser testing and other pieces, things like getting our static code analysis uh, in, connected in and, uh, and our security analysis, all those pieces. And so we've, we've highlighted here with the, the black border, uh, all of the different elements that, I, that have uh, a significant number of uh, other pieces that open up because of it. And, uh, and these become very strategic uh, elements to go after in terms of opening up our capabilities and, and allowing for future, uh, future options for us. So as we're then pulling this together, I, you know, coming back to our cooking metaphor, uh, a good recipe, it has a, a few main ingredients and it's got some seasoning to bring it all together. And then it's got some complimentary dishes for balance. And I, and so all these pieces kind of work together. They're harmonious. They, they, they strengthen each other. Well, the same thing happens when we get into, uh, if we look at our recipe for DevOps success. Again, we want to focus on a few key areas. It can be overwhelming to, to go after everything. And quite frankly, you end up with too much work in progress and difficulty getting any of it done. So by focusing, by narrowing down what, what we start with, we allow ourselves to actually get to the other things that we want to do by just getting some stuff finished. So we focus on those first few key areas. And then we season with supporting tools. And when we talk about supporting tools, what we, what's important here is that we want to take the enablement teams out of the day-to-day -day support. We don't want uh, DevOps teams that, that uh, every development team has to come to and ask for help in order to get their piece done. Instead, what we want is self-service, where the development team can own their own success, where they can control their own domain and, and work through stuff. That, on top of increasing the flow of work, by, allow, by eliminating the wait states, waiting for somebody to do something, right? The whole, I send off a request, I wait two days for somebody to do something, and then I have to follow back up and say, hey, why isn't it done? Can we get it? Please, 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 can we expedite that? Instead, I can do it myself, and I can control when it gets done. Uh, on top of that, it takes load off of that enablement team. That's work that they don't have to do. The system does it for it. I've given you self-service tooling and you can, you can go do it yourself and, uh, and the, the tooling will take care of all the rest of it. And then we complement those pieces within follow-on capabilities. As we start getting some uh, those first few key areas, right? As we start getting the supporting tools so it's self-service, then we start adding follow-on capabilities that add to what's available, that add to the, cap the, the overall capabilities and make things easier. You know, one of the great uh, adages of adoption for anything is that if you want something, if you want people to adopt something, you have to make it easier to do it the right way than to do it the old way. And uh, and so the whole goal here is creating opportunities, creating uh, creating capabilities that that raise the bar, that that make it easy to do it right and, and to do it better. So where do I start with this then? I, you know, we've talked about kind of all different things here. What's the first step? Well, start by mapping out your value stream. Start by looking at uh, what are all the handoffs that happen in the entire process from when we have something that we've decided we want to work on, something we want to, to deliver, and when it actually gets out to production look at all the different points where you where a team has to hand off something to another team or ask another team to, to, to do a next step before they can then carry forward. Look at how long it, they spend waiting uh, blocks for, uh, for the next team to do their piece. And then start going through and unblocking those pieces that, that are blocking the most teams. Look and, and, and go find a team that is one of those teams blocked and ask them to be your beta customer. Ask them to participate in the process so they can give you feedback. I, you know, one of the things that I find over and over again is that 
uh, is that those internal enabling teams don't necessarily recognize that the developers on uh, across the organization are their customers and building a great developer experience is actually a really valuable thing for improving the flow in which work gets out and in which high quality valuable work gets out and not just junk. And so then we want to take then if we're uh, if we're going to go un unblock that thing, we need to then to, to, to do so, we turn the wait states into either automation or self-service so that, again, the team can control things themselves and they can move forward at their own pace. And then we just rinse and repeat and keep going. Uh, and there's there's some interesting, thing, interesting things that happen as we do that. With every spot that we improve, it boosts the entire ecosystem and everything gets better. The reason for that is that when we clear one bottleneck, the flow accelerates across the whole system until something else becomes the new bottleneck. And then we resolve that bottleneck and flow accelerates again until again, we discover a new one. And so continually working towards that goal of finding the bottlenecks, finding what's blocking teams from moving things forward, from getting rapid feedback about, is this code that we've, we've just written, is it production ready? Is it, uh, is it safe and valuable to put into production in front of customers? The quicker we can get that to them, the less expensive it is to develop, the less expensive it is to capture that value from our customers. So then if all of that's true, really what we're saying is that DevOps isn't any of these things, or even all of them. It's actually the continuous upward trajectory of improvement, one small journey at a time. And so thinking about that, right, this is, uh, this is really the, the mindset and the approach that, that we're looking for. This is, uh, this is the overall goal. This is the outcome that we're looking for uh, but it's, again, still in service of something. Like, what are those improvements that we need? Are we out there looking to improve revenue, reduce costs, improve experiences? What is it we're trying to accomplish? All of this is still in service of an outcome, always looking to then uh, what are the improvements and how do we can continually make things better, raising the bar each step along the way. And so we do that in small journeys. Uh, the concepts from story mapping and journey mapping still apply, right? And we can still go look at the capabilities and map out where are we right now? What is it we're trying to do? What steps are needing, needed? And what options can we open up so that we can we, uh, give ourselves the ability to, to take on more? Uh, and again, with the, uh, the tools that are included in GitLab, a lot of these capabilities are fairly easy to go after but they still require uh, the organization to wrap its head around uh, it, what's valuable about it. How are we gonna use it within the organization? Uh, tools can be used to, to automate bad process just as much as any as good process. Um, what's, what's valuable is tools that, that help us deliver the outcomes we want. And so we, uh, we're looking for that continuous improvement by continuously remixing and refining all the right ingredients. And with that, I will turn the time back over to Rich. Hey, thank you so, so much. Um, that was a great presentation. Those, those uh, drawings are just incredible. Absolutely love that. Um, as promised now, I'd like to turn it over to Matt Wilson and Matt's gonna talk about vulnerability lifecycle management. Matt, take it away. All right, thanks, Rich. Let me get the screen share fired up here. Okay. So again, I'm Matt Wilson, one of the senior product managers with GitLab. My specific stage of the GitLab product is secure, and I focus on vulnerability management. And I'd like to talk about a concept that I call vulnerability lifecycle management. But before we get into that, I want to highlight why improving security of the development process is so critical. So at the end of last year, the estimates for total damage and prevention costs globally in cybersecurity was $6 trillion. 
that's with a T, and the breach costs alone are exceeding $2 trillion. So that's basically Apple's entire global market cap lost just in breach costs every single year. That does a tremendous amount of waste and value. Now, for US-based companies, we're seeing that the average breach cost is roughly $9 million, and that's going up every year. And as the number of records included in the breach go up, so do the costs associated with that. Now, this is everything from damage to the impacted system, remediation costs, losses due to reputational damage, regulatory penalties, et cetera. And you can see once you get into the mega breach territory, over 50 million records, you're talking potentially hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, a vulnerability is really just a weakness which can be exploited. We're gonna be talking about software vulnerabilities here, but it could just as easily be in hardware or a physical system like a building or even a house. So much like software has a life cycle, sort of has a beginning, hopefully a very long and productive middle and eventually an end, a sunset, so does a vulnerability. The difference is we want to try to catch vulnerabilities and cut their life cycle short as close to the inception as possible. So the life cycle looks something like this. First, you overlook something. There is a security aspect that wasn't accounted for in the design or the planning phase, some sort of oversight that kind of sets the stage for the actual creation. At some point, you're actually writing code that contains a security weakness. Now, if that doesn't get caught, it evades evades detection. You may or may not have tooling in place or processes, but that introduced weakness was missed, which means that it can now be incorporated. You now have that weakness in a place where you don't want it. This is excuse me, potentially merged into your release or your production branch, which sets the stage for it to escape. That vulnerable code is now deployed into a place where it can be accessible and potentially exploited. Now, this doesn't have to be your production public-facing website. This could also be an internal system. It's just that code, that weakness is now in the application where it is now vulnerable. This is going to lead to some form of an impact. Now, the vulnerability, it could be exploited. That's obviously worst case. But as we're going to see in a second here, it's also the part where you're going to have the highest cost to actually fix the vulnerability, even if there's no exploitation. But of course, before you can do that, you actually have to detect it. It's made it this far in the life cycle without anybody realizing there was a vulnerability. So at some point you've discovered it, hopefully not because of a news report about a very public breach that you've had or a ransomware attack, which gives away sort of the impact and detection at the same time. Only after you detect it, can you finally remediate it? You can take action to remove the vulnerability and then repair or protect the impacted systems. So looking at the costs, you'll see that if you are able to address a vulnerability early in its life cycle, that's where you're going to have the least amount of cost and impact. And this really applies for any sort of defects in your software code. Now, as you progress forward, you start to see that that cost multiplies, but it's still relatively reasonable if you can get it up to the point where you've actually deployed that code into some sort of exposed or production environment. Now, the highest cost is, of course, if you've detected it running in production, up to potentially 30 to 100 times more cost than if you had caught it in the design phase. Now, this doesn't actually include the cost of any potential impact due to a data breach or other sort of compromise. This is just because of all of the people, all the time spent, all the hands that have touched that code, pushing it forward, and then that delay of weeks or months is going to require a pretty big context shift for the team that has to actually probably put down feature work and bring it all the way back to, re, uh, to resolve it. Now, I'd like to think about this a little bit uh, differently to show how the vulnerability lifecycle relates to the development lifecycle. So if you were to have no controls in place, no tooling, no processes, no checking for vulnerabilities, then every oversight that introduces a security weakness is going to carry forward. Each step builds upon the mistakes of the previous phase. So think of these boxes or bars as sort of the amount of potential weaknesses or vulnerabilities that were introduced at each stage. Now, the result is that the final deployed product is gonna have the greatest potential attack surface because it is an aggregate 
of every missed security weakness across your entire SDLC. Now, to talk uh, to Ken, carry forward the analogy that Nate had with the food, I think we'll make this a little bit more tangible by giving an example. So let's imagine you owned a, a seafood restaurant. The worst possible place to catch a problem is after customers eat your food. Now imagine that you got a shipment of bad oysters. Now if you had no checks in place and you serve it, you're only gonna find out later you had a lot of customers that maybe got food poisoning. That's gonna be very costly in terms of compensating the affected customers, not to mention reputational damage from bad social media exposure. These customers probably aren't gonna eat there again, but they're gonna tell their friends not to either. But that seems a little unrealistic. If you had a restaurant, I would imagine your wait staff would be attentive to that. They're gonna notice something that maybe seems off. The first customer that complains about the oysters, send the food back to the kitchen. You've lost money still on the ingredients and the time that went into cooking the dish, but the damage is gonna be less. Well, now consider if the chef noticed it when she was preparing the oysters, something seems off and she decides, let's not use them, let's pull them from the menu tonight. Or maybe the prep cook, after only a couple of oysters said, mm, it seems like we got a bad batch. I don't think we should put these on the menu. Or even whoever purchased them, stop it before it ever got into the kitchen in the first place. They said, you know, this doesn't seem to be up to our usual standards of quality. We're not gonna serve oysters tonight. So at every step, the checking and the oversight is gonna save more and more cost and reduce the risk the closer to the beginning of that process you can catch any potential problem. So let's go back to the attack surface potential again. Software development processes, they can be complex. They've got many people, many tools, many moving parts. So if you find yourself being unsure where to start improving security, just consider this. Even implementing one or a small handful of changes in just one stage of your SDLC can start to reduce the attack surface potential by either preventing security mistakes in that phase or possibly catching those from a previous phase from moving downstream. So the resulting reduction in your attack surface is a corresponding decrease in reduction in your exposure risk. Less potential vulnerabilities is going to mean fewer points of attack for a malicious actor. Now, imagine if you had comprehensive controls. You've now figured out one or more tools or processes that you can implement at every single phase of your SDLC. You'll now see the greatest reduction in the attack surface potential and a corresponding greatest exposure reduction. Now, if you've adopted or you're thinking about adopting modern DevOps practices, you hopefully also have a single DevOps platform like GitLab or at least a tightly integrated tool chain. There's going to be touch points at every step in a DevOps process where you can try to identify and stop vulnerabilities. Integrating not just more tools into your process, but also the security teams as well to truly enable a DevSecOps process where you've got your developers, you have your IT and ops teams and your security teams working with the same view, processes and understanding from a vulnerability management perspective. I mean, it sounds pretty easy. In a restaurant, you would expect everybody working from the back of the house to the front of the house, coordinating on delivering a single product to the customers. It would be crazy to think that you had your prep cooks and your chefs in different physical buildings, your wait staff in a different set of buildings, and that they were only sort of passing notes back and forth to communicate. That's gonna generate a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of friction. Well, unfortunately, we still see those same silos in a lot of organizations. Engineering, IT ops, or your application security teams are often still working in different tools. And there's, for lack of a better word, throwing tickets over the wall at each other because they don't use the same ticketing system. In some cases, they're manually copying and pasting. This is creating a lot of friction and a lot of inefficiencies that are not really letting you properly address vulnerabilities at every stage of your SDLC. So every year, GitLab runs a state of DevOps survey. And this year, we had roughly 4,000 respondents. And what we found was that while security is an increasingly top of mind topic and it's that responsibility is being pushed into developers, there is still a lot of that uncertainty and that friction. So for instance, about 40% of developers now feel fully responsible for the security of their organization, while another third says that they're sharing that burden with another team. So you've got about 70 
excuse me, 70% of your developers have some or all of the security responsibility, but they may or may not be set up for success. That's especially difficult if they're not using the same shared tool space with their security teams. And we see that this is often the case because security is still a sticking point for a lot of team members. It's happening too late in the process and it's a struggle to unpack, process and fix vulnerabilities. So keeping in mind that a lot of software engineers, they're not security experts. They're experts in the design and the construction of features, basically. Now on the flip side, a lot of the security teams find it hard to get things addressed properly. So about a third say that it's tough to track the status of bug fixes, probably because they are using different tools or ticketing systems to track the work. It's hard to prioritize the remediations. They have to compete with feature work. And about another third said that it's difficult just to find someone to fix the problems. So you can imagine if all you're responsible for is detection and another team and another tool somewhere is responsible for doing the work, that's gonna present a lot of problems. Now, if we look at a typical vulnerability testing cycle from a traditional AppSec process, we'll start to see why. It's a very linear process. And what you find a lot is a dynamic application security test, a DAST test, is run only near the end of the SDLC because it requires a working application to test it. So the individual developer's work at this point has already been probably committed, merged into a release branch, and typically it's now in a dedicated QA environment where those tests are gonna be performed alongside of these security tests, the DAS scans. Now, because DAS occurs so late in the life cycle, this was sort of one of the reasons that gave rise to interactive application security testing or IAST. The theory was that if you instrument the application, it can be automatically tested for security vulnerabilities while the QA tests are done. The intent is to enable developers, but a working application is still required. And now you've put an additional burden on developers that they actually have to instrument their applications properly. So these are the same developers that are not security experts. This complication is why we see very slow and low adoption of IS tools out in the real world. Now compare this to something like a shift left security model. GitLab thinks that security is a team sport. Everybody should be playing in the same team. So why not play in the same field? Security testing here can actually happen in the developer's feature branch. Because the source code is going to be available at this early stage, you can actually run scans like static analysis tests or secret detection and dependency checks alongside something that's actually pretty unique to GitLab. We call them review apps. So a review app actually spins up an ephemeral test environment right in the pipeline of that feature branch and allows you to run those dynamic like a DAST scan, every single commit. Now the developer is gonna to get to see immediate results of every change they made so that they can take care of any problems right away. Now, if the developer can iterate quickly to resolve vulnerabilities, the security team may never actually see them. So this is going to take a lot of burden off an already overburdened stretched in security team because now they're not having to triage and push all these findings back to developers they're only getting a small subset of that. Now the security team can also get involved to review any outstanding issues and grant any needed exceptions or potentially provide developers additional feedback. Once the developer finishes up the code and it's gone through the security team, now it's ready to be merged into that main branch. So let's look at the developer flow again from a slightly different perspective. You'll see here that the security scans, they're embedded right in the middle of the process. It's not at the end. It's not two to four weeks later at the end of the sprint cycle. It's immediate, right after the commit happens. So by moving it into the developer workflow, you're gonna get fast feedback necessary for a modern agile process or a CI CD process. Now note that it also allows for any discussions and approvals from your security team as a natural integrated part of that development flow. So it's not disconnected and it's not coming way after the fact. Any security issues are also gonna have a very well-defined context of just the feature under development. And by handling that remediation as part of the cycle, it's gonna ensure only clear security tested code makes it out to production. Now it also offers some options for enforcing uh, compliance because we offer things like enforceable automatic scan policies 
and you can even block merging into your protected branches, your main branch, any code that has new vulnerabilities without explicit security approval. Now, while GitLab does offer a comprehensive set of security tools, there are things that actually go outside of the tool. There are processes that you should really think about before you even begin writing the software. One of the first and probably best examples is adopting a secure SDLC. So this is a different way of thinking about your software construction that's gonna help you identify security risks early, which will minimize your remediation costs later. Microsoft and NIST both have published guidelines for this, which are great starting places. Make sure that you're defining your security requirements. You'd be surprised at the number of organizations that don't actually have an accessible shared space where all security requirements for an application are written down. And more importantly, make sure that you keep them updated. It's not just about additional functionality changes, but this is regulatory and threat landscape changes as well. So make sure you have that single source of truth for your security requirements. Make sure that your developers have access to some secure, <clears throat> excuse me, to some security training. I speak to a lot of developers and one common refrain from them is very rarely do they get any sort of formal security training as part of their education. Universities are just not training them to be security professionals. But on the flip side, a lot of companies also don't offer that kind of ongoing or in-depth security training. For many, it's just that annual one hour, don't click on the spam emails that we all get. So if you can, try to find some sort of a security training that's going to empower your developers and level up their security skills. They, some of them like very long, let's say the week-long immersive courses, but what a lot more find effective is a very quick, short, in-context lesson, something that's interactive. So things with an actual code example that they can work through. Now, the developers, if they're getting results out of a scanning tool, and then they can immediately look at a particular vulnerability or weakness and say, I'd like to find out more about that. Let me do a micro lesson. That works best. And there are a number of third-party training vendors that offer this kind of functionality. And then last, use threat modeling. So this is a technique you can certainly use a dedicated piece of software for, but it could also be as easy as writing something on a Google Doc or on a whiteboard, but really mapping out all potential risk sources and coming up with mitigation plans so that you can address them before they become problems. So let's go back to our DevOps process flow here. Now, there's gonna be many opportunities to address vulnerabilities at every phase. You don't have to tackle all this at once. A tool like GitLab can give you a big jumpstart by providing not, best in, not just best in class source code management and CI CD, but also a comprehensive security tool set out of the box that includes static analysis, dynamic analysis, dependency scanning, secret detection, two different types of fuzz testing, as well as container scanning and integrated vulnerability management. So we're putting security tools in the same place your development and your ops team are or could already be working together in one collaborative platform with one shared view. So if we go back to where we started with the vulnerability management lifecycle, of course the goal is to stop vulnerabilities before they ever get a chance to progress, which is where the impacts and the costs are gonna be lowest. But of course, this isn't possible 100% of the time. So, what I hope you'll start to think about is that there are many potential opportunities, many tools, techniques, or processes that you could implement into the same tool set, hopefully, but you can expand what you're doing today so that you have the greatest possible coverage, so that you're covering your entire DevSecOps process to deal with vulnerabilities, no matter where you encounter them in their life cycle. Now to go back one more time to our cooking analogy, think of GitLab like a fully stocked DevSecOps commercial kitchen. We're gonna provide virtually every appliance or tool that you can imagine in one single place, all in one package. But a kitchen by itself isn't enough to create great cuisine and it's certainly not enough to make you a master chef. You need ingredients, you need recipes, and you need people to put it all together. You may even wanna bring some of your own tools. And as an open platform that likes to play nice with everybody, that's certainly possible. You have your favorite stand mixer, bring it in. 
But these are going to be your programming languages, your frameworks, and all of your teams, your development, your ops, your security, even your product teams that you're going to use to create business critical software. Think about it this way. If you're moving from cooking for yourself at home to opening a restaurant, there's a lot to consider in such a big transition. A partner like C Prime can help operationalize your digital transformation or cloud migration by providing that training, process optimization, and security best practices. If you want to think of them as the master chefs and restaurateurs ready to share their expertise and guide you around that GitLab DevSecOps kitchen, we think you'll be able to create your masterpiece, be it food or be it software, safely and securely. With that, I'm gonna say thank you, and I'm gonna hand it back over to Rich. Matt, thank you so much. Um, what a great presentation. Uh, what we'd like to do now is give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have had for our presenters. Um, so please, again, utilize that Q&A function to ask any questions that you have. We have a few uh, teed up already. So let me start with the first one. Um, this is for, uh, again, both uh, Matt and Nate. What's the process of plotting out the value stream and understanding the blockers in that stream? So that's a great question. I, there's there's a number of things out there for I that kind of you know books and and all kinds of other things for for how to do that. Um, our coaches can also help facilitate that. I uh, help you walk you th help walk you through it so that uh, you can get there. The basic concept is really just paying attention to uh, what are all the handoffs, right? And, and just line those all up and, and look at all the different steps that your code has to go through before it gets out to production and, and who, where are all the places where it has to change hands. And then for each one of those, I measure the, uh, the, work time. So how long does it spend somebody actually working on it? Uh, as well as how long does it spend waiting before somebody works on it? And I, and then look at, you know, where is all the time going? Um, that becomes really interesting to start exploring what's happening. You know, what's the overall time it takes for a, a piece to get from beginning to end? And, uh, and what are the chunks that are just really big? And I, uh, and need some, uh, need some improvement. Awesome, thank you so much, Nate. Um, Andy had another great question. Um, a few of these silos that they're dealing with are due to company culture. Are there any tips or case studies that you can provide as a means of helping to change company culture? Um, I can take that one as well. I so you're right, a lot of this stuff is culture. And um, that means that I actually changing it is, is going to require significant uh, amount of work, um, often even including leadership, right? Because uh, culture is a reflection of the, uh, of the behavior of the leaders of that, of that particular organization or area of the organization. Uh, so I, there's a number of different things that, we, that can be done with that. There's ways to coach both at the, at the ground level as well as at the executive level and enterprise level. Um, there's also uh, tools like, uh, so we use things like uh, the dojos and, uh, and other similar capabilities to um, essentially um, incubate um, culture and spread it across the organization. And I, uh, and that's something that if, if you want to go into some detail with, I, I can, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you about that offline. Awesome. Uh, Matt, uh, Andy had one more great question for you as well. Would it be an idea for security testing to happen alongside all the other testing like unit integration, et cetera? Yes, absolutely. In fact, that's exactly what you would typically see. So. GitLab has extremely flexible integration uh, pipelines. It's a CI configured with a YAML file. What we typically find is our users will divide up their pipeline jobs into stages. So every single commit, you can kick off something like your unit 
tests, if you want to separate out your unit versus integration versus functional tests into different pipeline stages, that's fine. Then you can also incorporate one or more of those security scans. Because the jobs can be parallelized, it's much, much faster. So you don't actually need to wait for the security scans to run your integration test, just as long as the downstream stages don't require anything from the upstream stages, if that makes sense. So we find that when you're highly parallelized like that, and you set up your pipeline jobs, uh, you know, I guess efficiently, it may only take minutes to run everything beginning to end. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, one final question for you as well. Uh, this is from Thomas. Can you ship left security scans to something like IDE plugin or GitHub Actions? So right now we don't have the scanners themselves available for the IDE. I know we're looking at pulling a little bit more of those results back. One of the things, if you are scanning locally, that's gonna be a lot more taxing on the developer machines. So if you're allowing our CI runners to handle that, it's gonna be a lot less resource intensive locally. The other advantage to that is by running all the jobs inside of GitLab, you're going to have that same shared view, right? So anybody on the development team, the security team, the ops team can see the result of that commit and the result of the scans, as well as any artifacts that come out like security findings. If you're doing that all locally, that information is gonna be sort of hidden and siloed on that developer's machine. So that's why we encourage people to run the scans, at least with something like GitLab, inside of our, um, our, our MR uh, pipelines when you're doing feature development like that. So I'd love to add to that for a second, if you don't mind. Um, and yeah. Hi, Tommy, glad you could join us. Um, this, is, this is one of those pieces that I, there's value in the, uh, the testing pyramid, right? So the, the concept of you want uh, lots of very small tests that run really fast, that are, run the closest to the developer, and then uh, then smaller sets of more longer running and, and more complicated tests um, that run a little bit further and further away from the developer. Um, just recognizing to, to your point earlier, Matt, the uh, the load that that puts on the developer machine and the impact that has in, in the way they work. Um, but this is where uh, it's really useful to start layering that into your pipelines to where I, you've got uh, some basic stuff that you're covering at a developer level. And some of that you might even be able to get, you know, maybe you can get some of your static security testing uh, running at the developer level, um, but you're still going to want to rerun it uh, within the pipeline itself uh, to, to be able to get that auditability and, uh, and be able to, to verify for your security folks or whoever else cares that, uh, that everything has been, been done properly. Um, and so it's a matter of uh, optimizing around um, what feedback is worth the investment of developer time and uh, CPU uh, to, to get all the way local versus what am I okay putting off. And this is actually one of the areas where uh, feature branches are really nice because uh, a developer working in the feature branch can, uh, can make constant commits all the way through and continually pushing the pieces off, you know, offloading that testing over to the pipeline, uh, so so they're getting that regular feedback and uh, and know what's what's production ready before we get ready to merge. Awesome. Thank you both very much for that answer. And again, thank you both very much for today's informative in session. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, we want to thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, in the Zoom chat right now, you will see a link. Uh, to a survey. We would love to have you uh, fill out that survey. Um, uh, you have an opportunity to win a Ring 12-piece home security kit, an Amazon gift card, or an Apple AirPod Pro. Um, winners will be notified. And also a reminder, we will be sending out the recording of this webcast in the next few days, so please keep your eyes out for it. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We appreciate you being here.